WBNE. Hello and welcome to episode 72, all about Two Towers, theatrical edition, part two, being the 72nd part of That's What I'm Talking About. My name is Mary Clay. If that's too complicated for you, just call me MC. And today I'm joined by Caitlin and Jamie of the Bechdel cast. Welcome. Hi. Hello. Thank you so much for coming on to talk about Two Towers. Listeners, I have been probably annoying uh, Jamie and Caitlin for the last month since I first emailed them <laughs> with all of the changes and, and being like, oh, we're going to cover this part. Oh, no, just kidding. We're going to cover 10 minutes less of that. Just kidding. We're going to do another 10 minutes less of that. So I'm glad that we're finally able to sit down and, and talk about it. I like the chunk we're covering. It was a, It's a good chunk. Oh, it's really great. I'm really excited. Yeah. There was one scene where I, I wrote well over a page of notes just for, for one scene. So uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, first, why don't you guys tell me a little bit about your experience and your background with Lord of the Rings? If you, you know, did you grow up watching it? Was it something that came into your life later? What was what's Lord of the Rings to you guys? I think my answer is probably uh, less uh, exciting than Caitlin's. My my history with Lord of the Rings is that I uh, saw the movies when they came out when I was like definitely too young to know what was happening in them, but I saw them all. <laughs> And my mom and, and yeah, my mom and I saw them both and we both were like, we get it, but we didn't. And <laughs> and we both we each had our crushes. I was uh huge Orlando Bloomhead. She mm-hmm. like all moms was all about Aragorn. Oh yeah. And then I later uh read The Fellowship of the Ring, and that is my entire history. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, I, the movies came out in, I think, 01, 02, and 03, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Yes, that's correct. I I was in high school. I didn't see the first one in theaters, but I saw it when it came out on DVD. And I was like, oh my God, I love this. And I became obsessed with it. I uh, watched the F- the fellowship of the ring on dvd probably every day until the oh <laughs> two towers gosh. came out like i was watching it constantly <laughs> oh, yeah. i i can recite the the basically the whole trilogy dialogue wise start to finish i'm you know not proud of it but i'm not not proud of that uh i <laughs> saw two towers in theaters five times i saw return of the king in theaters six times uh i i dressed I, up I forgot as it was this much I remember I know, you I, dressed up as Frodo. <laughs> I dressed as Frodo. I cosplayed as Frodo during one of the midnight, like the the midnight premiere uh-huh. of Return of the King. Um, but since then, I was like, I remained obsessed into like the mid two thousands. But then my my fandom kind of, um, I just sort of, I was like, oh, there's other things. I, oh, I like, I you know, there's other things to like. <laughs> let me move on um but i still very much uh love and appreciate this trilogy but uh there was a there was a while though where i had cultivated an entire personality around loving lord of the rings i mean that's essentially what i've become since starting this podcast (laughs) it's a bit concerning there was a a point where i was talking with someone and they were like oh well let's talk about we don't have to talk about lord of the rings we can talk about something else and my mind literally went blank because i was like i don't know what else i've been doing (laughs) you're like wait hold on (laughs) it's just all lord of the rings all of the time so (laughs) Which isn't a bad thing, but um, I've all. um, I've recently become. I had a a TikTok blow up that was um, basically just an Aragorn thirst TikTok. Ooh, <laughs> hell yeah! And um, I don't mind being that girl on TikTok that's into Aragorn. You know, it, honestly, <laughs> there are worse things to happen. As I continue to like watch these movies, yeah, uh, in like. Now I'm like, oh, I see what my mom was all about back then. Because <laughs> I used to be like, Aragorn's old. I don't, <laughs> but then I'm like, no, he's not. He's, he's, <laughs> he's so hot. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. 
He's, hot. he's a beautiful that's man. My, that's our main takeaway from the trilogy. Aragorn, mm-hmm. hot. Legolas, also hot. Legolas, mm-hmm. still hot. Yeah, it, it wasn't that I was wrong when I was nine. It just, there was a bigger world than I realized. Yeah, sure. exactly. There were a lot of feelings for you left to, to explore yet in your life. Mm-hmm. That's the beauty of the movies. And yes. I also, I, I became a huge Miranda Otto fan, like, way later because she's in my favorite bad movie ever, I Frankenstein, starring Aaron Eckhart. <laughs> so that was where... I have where... never heard of this movie. And oh I my love... Gosh. You said it's a bad movie. I love bad movies. It's the worst movie. It's on Amazon Prime. If if you um, if you have Amazon Prime, it's like Aaron Eckhart in this really broody, expensive looking, like sexy Frankenstein <laughs> movie, and she and Miranda Otto plays the queen of the gargoyles, and she's like wearing oh. this really cheap costume. It's great. <laughs> oh it's, no! Poor we covered thing. it recently on the Bechtel cast, and it is atrocious the movie it is uh, unintelligible plot wise it like it's my favorite it's movie a mess <laughs> i've seen it more than lord of the rings <laughs> <laughs> um well speaking of miranda otto we luckily have a lot to talk about her yeah. in today's episode mm-hmm. Hello, it's Mary Clay from the future here to give you this week's chaotic movie summary. So here we go. The Lorax, I mean Treebeard, is keeping Merry and Pippin safe while giving them a lesson about how nature has feelings and the ants are dying out. We once again leave our favorite hobbits to check in on our least favorite hobbits. Frodo, Sam, and Gollum hide outside of the heavily guarded Black Gates, featuring orcs, trolls, and a touch of racism. Sam nearly blows the entire mission after falling down a cliff and getting buried up to his chest in dirt somehow, but don't worry, a magic cloak trick saves them despite doing it in plain sight of the guards. Gollum reveals another way into Mordor is via a giant staircase and a secret tunnel, and promises to lead them that way instead. In Edoras, Saruman has complete control over Theoden, who doesn't even realize that his son Theodred is (laughs) Theodred. I'm really proud of that one. Wormtongue tries to creep on Eowyn, but she and her gigantic sleeves aren't having any of it. She runs outside to dramatically overlook the town and exchange the first of many longing glances with Aragorn. Gandalf tricks the guards into letting him keep his staff, which for some reason Wormtongue doesn't notice, despite the fact that it's literally a giant staff. Gandalf performs a full-on exorcism on Theoden, casts Saruman out of his soul, and Theoden restores to his former self. And apparently his former self is a terrible leader. Ignoring the advice of everyone around him, he decides that with Saruman's forces growing closer, they will evacuate to Helm's Deep. Gandalf runs off on a cryptic mission and promises to return at the absolute last second. Eowyn shows off her swordsmanship, or shall I say swordswomanship, skills, and explains to Aragorn that the women of Rohan learn to fight since clearly all of the men in leadership positions are terrible. After they exchange a few more longing glances, all of Edoras head for Helm's Deep while Saruman uses more vague wizard magic to create another beast. All right, on with the pod. So first we start off with a, it's a very brief scene with, uh, we cut back to Treebeard and Merry and Pippin, and he's kind of explaining about the ants and the trees and how they have been dying and there aren't enough ants around anymore and they are a dying ant to tea. Wow. Swish. Hey. Okay. <laughs> so I also went and did a lot of, um, I was trying to like learn as much as possible about how they filmed um, the tree beard stuff mm. because I found it really to be really interesting. And frankly, I didn't find out enough. Like it was, I there's more out there I know <laughs> of like how exactly the animatronics worked and, and like what um, Billy Boyd and Dominic Monaghan were, were doing. So so uh, the where is it? The animatronic puppet for Treebeard was 14 feet high, mm-hmm. and from what I could tell from like behind the scenes videos, they like would strap Dominic and Billy into I guess harnesses, and then have these like fake trees, and then it shows. Mm-hmm. All of this crew in like, you know, well, it's not green. They're in like blue screen suits Mm -hmm. and they're just moving it around (laughs) like they're walking through the the forest. And it it just looks it just looks really cool. That's amazing. I'm always like Mm -hmm. very 
positively impressed with like just how why did I say positively impressed I'm impressed (laughs) it's implied with like how much the effects from this movie hold up and like when you go back and I've seen for a movie for movies that I haven't seen that many times I really love watching the features with this movie and Mm -hmm. all of like the puppetry and it's like it's it's good shit it holds up yeah definitely (laughs) And it's um it's one of those things where the use of like practical effects mm-hmm. really saves it mm-hmm. twenty years on because mm-hmm. there were I complained a lot in the Fellowship of the Ring episodes how there are a lot of special effects that do not hold up well for me at least mm-hmm. and it was those instances where they weren't doing practical effects because it's CGI that's now twenty years old and it's like yeah they were it was like groundbreaking for the time but. Yeah, now we notice that it's, uh, you know, a bit dated. Yeah, Yeah, exactly that. It just doesn't look as old as I thought it would. You know, like you're just like, oh, 2001, I I, I thought that that would be worse. I feel like they were still making uh, movies with that bad special effects as recently as like five years ago. Well, the Hobbit yeah. trilogy has <laughs> yeah. worse special oh, yeah. effects than the Lord of the Rings trilogy that's does. What, that's what I've heard, yeah, that they switched. You can, like, really tell that they switched away from those practical effects and making, and, you know, having all of their extras decked out in orc makeup and costuming and stuff and then just switch to CGI. And apparently mm-hmm. it's, like, very negatively impacted by it. And that's that's so sad and disappointing. But yeah. whatever. I'll get, I'll get to those in who knows how long. <laughs> 20 years. <laughs> um, and then also speaking of, like, the, the effects holding up and CGI looking pretty well, we, we cut to a scene with Frodo, Sam, and Gollum at the Black Gates. And mm-hmm. just once again, I'm surprised by, ha- first of all, how well Andy Serkis is as Gollum. He is so good in it. He should have been nominated for an Oscar. Yes, I love Andy yeah. Serkis so much. So I I made a similar comment on last week's episode about like where is his Oscar, and I found I just read a trivia fact today that was said something like Peter Jackson and um maybe one I don't know one of the producers I don't remember who else it was like really tried to get him a nomination, oh, um good. but you have the actors have to like physically be in the movie in order to be nominated. What is that bullshire? I wonder if that's changed by now. I hope it has. I don't. Yeah, I have back in 2002, 2003. That was, you know, pretty much unheard of. Like, of course, you have to be in the movie because the idea of having a totally CGI, you know, animated character in a live action movie, aside from Space Jam, is totally unheard of at that point. (laughs) I feel like it had to have, like, my my guess for when that change would have been, like, James Cameron bullying people before Avatar came out. Because, <laughs> like, by those yeah. rules, Zoe Saldana doesn't, like, appear, like, you know, I don't know. And then there was a big, there was a big, like, uh, I remember they were trying to get Andy Serkis nominated again for Planet of the Apes a while back too but it just never happened poor Andy I'm trying to see it had there's like a whole I just google searched like qualifications for lead actor nomination Oscar mm-hmm. and there's like a whole document that I'm not gonna go into well. right now but yeah they should definitely change that and then let's retroactively give Andy Serkis his his Oscar nomination because yes. he's really good in it yeah and so yeah I'm just like super impressed with how every time he's on screen I just expect to I expect expect to be taken out of it a bit and be like oh this is like terrible you can tell that he's fake but it's it's really well done um yeah. almost to the harm of the movie because it makes you hate watching Gollum so much <laughs> mm-hmm. where are they anyway I totally like we went off on the Andy Circus tangent I mean deserved oh, oh but... they're in they're like about they're about to consider entering right yes Mordor through the the black gate yes yes yeah so we see um we get this that like you're not able to get in the book when you're reading it you get you get to see the scale of Sauron's forces you see he has hundreds of orcs there are these trolls or yeah trolls who are opening the gates and mm-hmm. doing the physical labor and you see that he is a force that Mordor and everything is a force to be reckoned with and it, it you you know truly one does not simply walk into Mordor <laughs> and you see that here especially if you're a klutz like Sam and you can't yes! stop oh ripping God. around yes there. so yeah as they're looking at the gates and being like oh should, like let's go in this is gonna be crazy oh no we have to turn back Sam falls over the whole like cliff he's on 
like crumbles. And what I don't understand, this scene makes me angry for a lot of reasons. One is that he somehow gets buried up to his chest in like dirt and gravel, which I don't think would have happened if you just like fell down a hill. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. And like, is it, is he like in quicksand that's made of gravel and also not wet? Like what happened? Is there like, is that a phenomenon where you can just sort of like yeah. fall into a pit of, of gravel? <laughs> And then exactly, pebbles yeah. and get stuck there. I, I and then and then the danger disappears so quickly that you're like, Well then why did we even why do we even do that? I don't know. This is the other thing that makes me angry. So then the, there are some orcs who see that there's like some dust over that's been disturbed on this hill. And they're like, oh, let's go investigate. And Frodo is frantically trying to dig Sam out. Then Frodo uses his cloak and sweeps it over them. And they turn into a rock. Mm-hmm. This is something that in the extended edition for Fellowship of the Ring, you have the context for what exactly these cloaks that they have do you mm-hmm. see um they are all given these cloaks in Lothlorien when they leave and uh Galadriel says something to the effect of like they shall hide you from enemies or you know keep you you know keep you unfriendly safe unfriendly eyes i think is the mm-hmm. quote <laughs> and and my impression is that it's made this material um also from like what I understand from how it's described in the book is that it's kind of this elven camouflage material and mm-hmm. it just naturally will blend them into whatever their surroundings are. Okay. So that's fine and dandy to turn them into a rock. However, they do this within plain sight of the orcs that are coming up to, <laughs> to investigate. So... Sure, they t- they successfully hid themselves, but there's no way that the orcs didn't see Frodo draw the cloak around them. It's just too They're close. They're right there. My guess okay. is like, the hobbits are just so small. <laughs> that was but, okay. I'm glad that you both are addressing this because... When it, when it comes to Lord of the Rings stuff, when something happens and I'm like, that doesn't make sense. I'm like, I probably just should have read the books, but that that doesn't make sense, right? That yeah. Does, the way it's presented doesn't make mm-hmm. sense. Okay. Feeling better. There's another thing I don't like about this scene and many <laughs> scenes like it in these movies where I don't, are they orcs that come up and investigate? I thought there were like humans or humanoid yeah, I'm not ex- entirely sure. There are a lot of different like dark creatures that mm-hmm. are just general servants of Sauron. Some of them are goblins, some of them are orcs. Well, they talk about it's I don't remember exactly when it is in the trilogy, but I think it's like Gandalf is explaining how there are like men, like mercenary humans who Sauron recruits to fight in his army. And we see different mm-hmm. shots of like these human men but here's what i take issue with is a lot of them are coded in either their costuming or skin color to be like not white oh yeah Mm -hmm. which is like obviously super racist and these people that we see in this scene i think fall into that uh very harmful situation where they i think again i think they're men but they're wearing like armor and garb. So it kind of it, it does like obscru- obstruct exactly what they look like. But you can see a little bit of their faces and their faces look pretty human. But they're also like the like the costuming they're wearing makes them seem sort of coded like Middle Eastern. And that happens a yes, lot in, yeah. uh, in fantasy, like in fantasy that crops up all the time. I know it like cropped up a lot in Game of Thrones. It even mm-hmm. crops up in like the Wizard of Oz with the winkies that are protecting the wicked witch of the west like it's so oh yeah uh inherent to mm-hmm. the genre that yeah i was i i didn't remember that but then when you see it you're like yep there's like, that oh, trope again there's yeah that racist it's trip it yeah it's very it's very unfortunate um and uh yeah, and it's also, um, I don't know if you guys know this, the actor who um, played the main Urukai in the Fellowship movie, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he also plays the Witch King, is, mm-hmm. ba- is the only person of color basically in the cast Mm -hmm. he is a i don't i don't have his name uh written down anymore because i deleted those set of notes but he is a a maori actor um who are the native people of of new zealand Mm -hmm. and i'm like 
They they really like went halfway with their effort to include people. Not even halfway. That's what I was saying. I was know? like, that's like zero percent. They went like backwards. <laughs> yeah. So they they got a person of color on the cast. Great. However, you completely you can't tell he's a person of color because you cover him up with you know an orc costume and, and you then, only cast him as Andrew, the villain. Yeah, you're covering him in a racist costume. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then the Witch King. Yeah. So listeners, I will once again direct you to I'll leave a link in the description. There's this really great collection of resources about race in Lord of the Rings and in Tolkien's works, and then also in the kind of fantasy genre in general, uh, awesome. because these resources do a much better job of, of talking about it than I do, because I have <laughs> almost zero knowledge about it. And oh shoot, there's something else I was going to say, something about the orcs and... I don't remember. Oh, okay. Yeah. So about the cloak. Back on the cloak, the most important (laughs) part of this discussion. I'm just kidding. Um, The other thing is that there are so many times in the movie where they're like, quick, hide. And they're all wearing these cloaks and they don't hide. And then this one moment they do it. And it mm-hmm. saves them. And like, I don't know if it's a thing with the elves magic where like it only works in the most desperate situations where they need to hide from their enemies mm-hmm. or if it, you know, so uh, it that's just fr- where I'm like, you can't give them these cloaks and then only use it for this one dramatic moment. Right. Especially when you don't include the explanation of the cloaks in the theatrical cut of the first mm-hmm. movie. And so you lose all that context. So if you don't know anything about the cloaks and you're just watching Two Towers, you're like, what? Are there cloaks made of a giant rock? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> what? So yeah, that's a, that was a weird choice. I truly wish we could uh, go back in time and talk to people right after they saw, like the average viewer who, I know. right after they saw this for the first time, because it's like, I wonder if that bumps people or if, I mean, I was like, I I was too young to really, I don't know, like I was too young and, it, and fantasy isn't really my genre. So I just sort of let everything wash over me and was just like, I for sure didn't notice that. It was just three hours of things happening and it was really loud and, and bright. And I was like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> but I wonder if like if, if these were things that like really bumped uh, first time viewers at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I've been wanting to see if I can find, um, like, uh, you know, internet forums from mm. the two thousand. You know, specifically Lord oh. of the Rings. Um, shoot, what's the? That would be really uh, fun. There was one for TV. I listened to a podcast called Gilmore Guys. Oh, yeah. That's our friends, Demi and Kevin. We know those guys. Yeah, they, like, frequently bring up comments from a TV forum, but I can't remember the name of it. Ah, dang it. Uh, I'm going to have to look that up anyway. But yeah, anyway, um, yeah, I'm really interested to see like what was everyone saying at the time? Because I was asking my previous guest, because in the previous section of the movie is the reveal that oh Gandalf is actually alive and now he's Gandalf the White and so I was Mm -hmm. asking him like at the time was that a surprise to you was that something that like you didn't see coming because when these movies initially came out you know it was a very small group of people who have read the books which is not you know the case usually when books are made into into movies usually mm-hmm. a lot of people come in already knowing what's happening mm-hmm. so and he was like you know honestly i don't remember but i have a feeling i wasn't even that surprised when it happened so i would listeners if you happen to know if there's a archive forum or or threat or even like I don't, was Reddit around in 2001? <laughs> uh, in I, my brain, Reddit has always been around, but... <laughs> I don't know. I feel like it was probably, like, back in the days of individual, like, super specific forums. I know. Or, or like... Even weirder. <sighs> I love it. I want to find maybe maybe there's a transcript of, like, a chat room somewhere. Yeah. Oh, right. Chat rooms. <laughs> that right. would be fun. That would be a really fun, like, way back machine Maybe someone hold. has, like, a live journal. Yeah. Oh, oh my live god. live journal? Yes. Or, that, like, Okay, these are all excellent leads I, that I'm going <laughs> to look into one day. I guarantee that there is like five trillion of those. Do you remember those like Angel Fire fan websites that would have like really oh. bright backgrounds and it would just be like, this is the Aragorn fan hub. And it would just be like <laughs> 500 low quality JPEGs of Vigo Mortensen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that. Also, I just remembered what the forum was Ooh. is is called that they use for Gilmore guys. It's television without pity. 
Oh, okay. I've never heard of that. So, anywho, Dang. okay, yeah. The cloaks, who knows what people thought at the time. I don't know. So Gollum stops them from entering and is like, no, you're going to get captured. That's not the way in. I can lead us down a different way. There's this long set of stairs and then a tunnel Mm -hmm. to which um, for my Avatar Last Airbender people, I say, secret tunnel, (laughs) secret tunnel. (laughs) Through the mountain, secret, 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 secret tunnel. And I can't unhear that whenever Gollum is like, it's a tunnel. <laughs> um, and yeah, you in this scene also, you really you really feel, again, Andy Circus. you really feel Gollum's desperation oh, yeah. to to either like get the ring for himself, you know, circumvent their plans and get it for himself and to also keep it from Sauron. And you like you really see the effect that it's that it's had on him, yeah, um, for sure. which is, you know, just going to be a growing, a growing theme throughout this movie and Return of the King as you see that also happening to Frodo. Yeah. So they set off to the secret tunnel. And now we we cut to what is probably going to be like the majority of the conversation for this episode, which we are now in Edoras mm-hmm. and... Gimli, Gandalf, Legolas, and Aragorn have rolled up and they're like, why is it so... Uh, I think Gimli says, like, you'll you'll see more cheer in a graveyard. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. They just are, like, dunking on, like, sad, poor people as they walk through. You're like, okay, whatever. <laughs> With their metaphorical horse. <laughs> well, I think the I think the implication there is more that like, oh, you really see the the grip that Saruman has on this part through Theoden and that like because Theoden is being possessed and controlled by Saruman that it's a like very decimated town, yeah. basically. Yeah, I'm just like, you know, got dunk on him, though. They're sad. <laughs> <laughs> and um the reason in the books when they roll up they i say roll up like they're <laughs> on like motorcycles or something they're all on horses whatever um when they ride up i guess they have the same reaction where like no one's happy to see them and the reason is because in the books you find out that gandalf stole shadow facts his horse from rohan <laughs> And that's why everyone is so everyone is like really mad at him because Shadow Fa- he says he's the lord of horses. <laughs> yeah. Rohan, they love their horses and and for Gandalf to take Shadow Fax was like a huge offense against them. Yeah. He just still he's like this is mine now. Bye. Mm-hmm. That is <laughs> yeah. that is helpful <laughs> context because I was just I was getting lost in the sauce in terms of the significance of the the metaphorical horse. I actually, now that I think about it, without having the context of the book that like Shadowfax is a really dope horse, it's so confusing. (laughs) They talk about it a lot, but I'm like, why do they keep bringing up the horse? Okay, this does make sense. Jamie, I'm going to tell you, you will, if you read the book, you would have the exact same reaction. You'd be like, (laughs) why does Tolkien keep bringing up these horses? He loved to talk about the horses and he named like every single Aww. horse that has a some kind of a major like even like the tiniest little role in the book. It's like and Theoden's horse Snowflake or something. I don't think it's Snowflake. It's like Snowmane or something. Tolkien was a <laughs> horse girl. That's Aww. so cool. Mm hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, he he is a hundred percent a horse girl, and there's um, apparently an extended edition scene in Two Towers that I haven't seen yet, where Aragorn has a a legit horse girl moment oh, ripped yes. directly from the plot of the Felicity American Girl doll books. Wait, I know now. Now I know no, what you're, you're talking about. Your language, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> where there's apparently a horse who is like everyone's like, oh no, he's wild. No one can tame him, and Aragorn. It's like I can. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I and can concur does. with that. I haven't seen the extended versions of Two Towers and uh, Return of the King as much as um the theatrical versions, but yeah, there's a moment where he's like taming this horse and then Eowyn's all like, "Oh my god, he's so hot cuz he knows how to tame a horse. I'm even oh. hornier for him." <laughs> I love um, a horse girl moment. That's great. Yep, mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm totally on board. And also speaking of um, Eowyn and Aragorn being horny for each other. <laughs> um, <laughs> Eowyn. Oh, wait. Sorry. I might be missing something. 
Oh, I'm kind of jumping. I'm jumping ahead of myself because first, when we come to Edoras, there's another. There's a scene uh, that's showing Wormtongue and Saruman and and oh, everything right. in the hall, mm-hmm. and you see and. Again, I really they totally nailed this part of the story because everything is feel it's so like stiff and it feels like really stifling. It's the there's like no light in the in his hall and you just feel it's very oppressive and you feel it. Mm-hmm. Eowyn tells him that or tells Theoden that Theodred, his son, has died. Mm-hmm. Um also, so Jamie, since you have, you know, the context of someone who's a more casual Lord of the Rings person, mm-hmm. I'm just curious, do you under, did you like understand or get what the relationship between Eowyn and Eomer and Theoden is? <laughs> no, I <laughs> definitely didn't. Was really guessing my way around. I've thought that he was, I, and I have, the thing is like, okay, I have seen these movies all the way through. A few times at this point, but every time I have to watch them again, I remember 0% of what happened except for like the last 10 minutes of the last movie. Um, I don't remember who any of these people are except for Eowyn. uh, And I guessed he was her dad, but then with the way she acted when he came back to normal, I kind of hope he wasn't her dad. (laughs) So Eowyn and Eomer... Are they are Theoden's niece oh and nephew? Mm-hmm. So he's he's her uncle. So he is their uncle. I would mm-hmm. not react. Okay, that way. Okay, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> and um, and for me watching this, I'm like, they really don't. Unless it's an extended edition thing, they like really don't explain. Like even just having a one be like uncle, like won't you listen to us? You would you would get that. You know, just an addition of like one extra line to explain that. I think context. she does been so say helpful. that she's like. She's like petting his hand and he's all like gnarled and stuff. And she's like, my lord, your son is dead. And he's just like, I'm possessed. And she's like, my lord, uncle. So she does like name him, uh, like identify him as her uncle. But it is exactly like one second. And if you're like rustle around and you don't hear that part, like you'll miss that whole thing. God, I was really trying. I thought it was her dad. And then when he like shook out the demon or whatever was going on there, uh, <laughs> he like she looked at him like she was about to like kiss him. And then I was like, wait a second. But mm. he was her uncle. So that's it's still weird. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, we also have a scene with Eowyn as she is mourning Theodred, mm-hmm. her cousin, mm-hmm. Theoden's son. Got it. Um, I'm also like making sure to enunciate because this is definitely a hundred percent the part of the story where like there's a lot of people in here, <laughs> and they all have nearly identical names. Yes, mm-hmm. between exactly. Eowyn and Arwen and Aemer, like it all just like it's all the same vowel sounds yeah mm-hmm. when we did the vectal cast episode of this we were just like eh, eh, and eh, eh, eh. <laughs> that was essentially me um the first definitely like the first several chapters of reading and doing the the episodes for that just being like <laughs> i don't know how to pronounce any of these but eventually you get to a point where you're like oh okay this looks these words look familiar enough to a different word i already know how to say it so does. let's go with that yeah. Yeah. So there's this scene where Eowyn is mourning Theodred. Wormtongue comes into the room. And this is uh, a plot line that I'm very conflicted about because um, I think it's very effective at doing a lot for Wormtongue's character because he's a disgusting, vile creature. Mm-hmm. So naturally, let's make him a pervert and a predator. You know, mm-hmm. that makes sense. He's gross and we hate him. However, this is not something that was in the books. And I'm like, did we really need to add this plot line of Eowyn be, you know, this implication that she's been like sexually harassed or assaulted by this dude? It says a lot about her character because there is that moment where Wormtongue is also trying to to like corrupt her as well. And she Mm. says, you know, your words are poison and and is able to walk away. So like you see the strength in her character to to recognize that. Yeah. Um, But like, could we not accomplish that? in a different way that doesn't victimize or objectify her. Right. Especially where there's only like three women in the entire nine Mm -hmm. hour thing that (laughs) making one of them a 
victim of sexual violence is just like ugh. yeah that and like Eowyn's character in general everything that happens to her or everything that she tries to do is like she's getting like the raw end of oh, yeah. the stick I don't what are expressions but <laughs> short like, end of the stick yeah because like she's in love with Aragorn and he doesn't reciprocate her feelings mm-hmm. she's always like I want to fight and everyone's like you're a woman so you can't like everything she tries to like she's being like her uncle's like possessed she her cousins are <laughs> dying her brother has to his, her brother yeah. gets banished and has to go like everything she's like her life sucks there- <laughs> and you're piling that on top of it it's so well, sad. and also yeah. on top of that just kind of the uh where her storyline goes where eventually like she does fight i do feel like there i i didn't know that she is not harassed by worm tongue in the books and i feel like that almost plays into like a, a really corny harmful movie trope that i don't like which is like mm-hmm. that somehow like i feel like it's often implied i'm trying to think of what the what the word for this um not phenomenal. She seems is, it but, seems very like damsel in distress to me. Well, for me it's like I feel like they're like, "Oh, well because she got assaulted, that was like part of what motivated her to go on and be great." And th- that was like a tool that was used in Game of Thrones quite a bit as well of like she like a female character cannot reach her true potential until she's like endured extreme suffering. Um when you would never mm-hmm. put that same um, especially like sexual connotation of the suffering uh, to a male character. I just don't like yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Oh, um, so a, fu- a fun fact I want to share. So yeah, speaking of like, she's one of three character, three female characters in these movies. <laughs> um, on Miranda Otto's first day of shooting, Liv Tyler reportedly welcomed her and said, I'm so glad there's another woman in this film. <laughs> oh. Which poor, uh, poor Kate Blanchett. Ooh. She's like, I'm but they here. don't even have any scenes together. <laughs> I was about to say, did they ever see each other again? Like, yeah, they <laughs> probably wouldn't be on set together, really, because they don't. Yes, they're not in scenes together. None of the women are in scenes together. Yeah, I should, yeah. I should add listeners. So, uh, the premise of of Caitlin and Jamie's podcast is: Does the movie pass the Bechdel test? Ta- the Bechdel <laughs> test. Yeah. Um, for for people who don't know what that is, it's quote unquote test about female representation in works of media or works of fiction, whatever. And the questions are, is there more than one named female character? Mm. Are they in a scene together? And do they speak? About something other than a man. Yeah, to someone. uh, Yeah, exactly. About someone other than a man. The answer to the first question is yes. The next two questions, a big fat no. (laughs) Nope. Um, Which is very sad for me because I feel like Arwen and Eowyn would be friends if we let them be friends. They have some common interests and not just Aragorn. They have the same taste as well. well. (laughs) The common interest is Aragorn, yeah. (laughs) Um, But I mean, like, given what happens to their characters where, spoiler alert, Eowyn marries Faramir Mm-hmm. And they are kind of a ruling couple. And then Arwen and Aragorn get married. And they're, you know, the ruling couple of, of Gondor. You know, they they would have lots of political allies if everyone was just friends. So, sure. but we don't get to see that, you know, whatever. <laughs> what we do get to see is, yeah. So Eowyn runs out. There's this very symbolic scene where a flag is ripped off and f- blows into the wind. Um mm-hmm. I read something that apparently this was just a pure coincidence and they kept it in, but I'm not sure if that was, it was like in a YouTube comment section oh, that I read that. So who knows if that was true. Wait, the, f- the flag coming mm-hmm. off? Oh, interesting. Which, yeah. So, um, and it like, so it floats off and it lands in the grass. And then as Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli, and Gandalf are coming up, Aragorn sees it. And I'm like, okay, so they so begins this setting up of a very intense connection between Eowyn and Aragorn mm. that goes nowhere. And I hate <laughs> it <laughs> because they just do it so well. And yeah. like they would be such a power couple because as they're approaching the like castle or whatever, Aragorn sees Arwen. Mary Clay from the future here. I definitely meant to say Eowyn. These names are the bane of my existence. Okay. Like standing off looking. It's kind of like, oh, is that a ghost? <laughs> I can't tell because she's an all white. 
Mm-hmm. Um, looking very depressed and sad. Yeah. I mean, now that you mention it, this the franchise really does go out of its way to like screw over Eowyn at every yes. turn. Yeah. God. It makes me very sad. And there's just, there's a lot of things they do to establish this connection between them only to tear it apart. And like, I get that, oh, you have to follow what happens in the book. But what happens in the book is that it's more of a one side. Actually, no, I'll tell you what happens in the book is that Tolkien wrote two towers and got to the chapter where he introduces Eowyn and there are legit there are like very longing glances between them and it's like he forgot that he already made Arwen and planned for Arwen and Aragorn (laughs) to get married and then he was like oh well can't can't have Eowyn be with him because I already did the Arwen thing so uh oops he like didn't go back and edit that section so frustrating especially because in the movies and I can't I can't speak to the books because I only read the first half of Fellowship and then I was like, oh, the Council of Elrond is so boring and I can't yep. keep <laughs> reading. But um, <laughs> the in the movies, the relationship we see between Aragorn and Arwen is all flashback. We never really see them interacting in real time in mm-hmm. the present, but you see real time connection and interaction between Aragorn and Eowyn so I'm way more invested in any romance that might develop there than I am in because I like care I am so not invested in this Arwen relationship because I'm just like I don't okay you used to hang out but what about now like (laughs) yeah it's uh it's complicated once you bring you know he was a boy she was an elf can I make it any more obvious (laughs) Um <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah, I have um uh I don't want to like go too much into it cuz I've already I've already ranted a lot about Arwen and um mm-hmm. it's just I have a lot of conflicting feelings about her because it's like the the writers were really trying something where they're like we're going to elevate her character cuz for both of y'all's context, she is not in the books like at all and right. hmm. basically the only thing that happens is Aragorn and Arwen meet in I think Rivendell, they don't even speak. They just like look at each other from across the room. (laughs) And then the next, I'm not even, this isn't an exaggeration. This isn't me like hyperbolizing what happens. This is legitimately what happens. The next time you see Arwen, they get married. (laughs) The... (laughs) killing it that and is it's... is that not how romance goes you just look meaningfully to each <laughs> other pretty... and then suddenly you're married that was my understanding yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. my understanding of of how i'll meet my lover is that i will um find them in an anonymous aol chat room we'll both be with our own partners but we'll talk so frequently and we form a, a strong friendship and then i have to shut down my bookstore and he's actually the owner of a book corporation uh, yes. but then we meet in person and he pretends to run away but meanwhile he well i don't know who he is he knows who i am and then he <laughs> slowly courts me until i fall in love with him it Wait, took me so this. long to figure out that you were talking about and oh my gosh, I can't even remember the name of the movie. It's not Sleepless You've in Seattle. It's You've got, got mail. mail. Yeah. <laughs> It was just like, wait, is it an oh? This I thought is a you. Movie I plot. thought it was going in a sleepless in Seattle. I want to meet someone by uh, hearing their child talk about how lonely they are on the radio. On the radio, or <laughs> alternatively, uh, for the the love of my life's twins to put their personal information on a billboard on the Sunset Strip, and then I have to go to their house and find out who they are. That's Billboard Dad. With <laughs> yeah, Olsen Jamie, of, of course, is talking about the Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen vehicle billboard dads slapper yeah for those of you not in the know oh my gosh <laughs> we're hitting a lot of good obscure references we've got the american girl dolls we've got the mary kate and ashley movies i mean these are all the pop culture references i frankenstein oh yeah i frankenstein yeah, yeah there we go yeah this is all you need to to know <laughs> about the lord of the rings movies Are these things. Um, Yeah, Arwen's character is just very disappointing because they tried to elevate her role for the movies, but they don't really give her much. They have this great action scene for her when you first meet her and she's introduced, but then that's kind of it because then she's just left to, she's just like wallowing around Rivendell being like, I'm not going to go with the other elves, dad. I'm going to stay here with Mm -hmm. my mortal lover, even if it kills me, which it will. (laughs) 
and like, um, good for her. Yeah, and it's it, it's not great, but um, yeah. And then we have Eowyn is fighting her own battles with the patriarchy. Galadriel is off being an elf, <laughs> the leader of the the elf people. Which, good for her, you know? Good for yeah. her. Okay, yeah. So they roll up. They have this scene where I wish they're like, oh, unarm yourselves before you go into the hall. And I really wish there was that classic moment where, like, everyone, you know, everyone takes their sword off, whatever. And then there's a pause. And they're like, every weapon. And they look at Gimli. And then he's like, fine. And then he takes out, like, 20 <laughs> more daggers and swords. And <laughs> and then, like, just one more thing where, like, he rolls up his pant leg and takes a knife out of a sock. And, like... <laughs> <laughs> surrenders that that would have that been be good fun. they walk in and worm tongue is like what are you doing here gandalf shut up leave and gandalf says keep your forked tongue behind your teeth and i'm like yeah gandalf nice. you mm-hmm. show some good insults in these movies pulls out his staff mm-hmm. and worm tongue is like i told you to take his staff despite the fact that he's had his staff like in his hands since he walked in <sighs> right how did he not notice exactly yeah (laughs) whatever and then we jump into a great fight sequence and i love this scene so much yeah there's this fight scene where gimli legolas and aragorn it's almost i don't know if it like read this way to you guys a bit but it was almost a little bit comedic to me where like gandalf is approaching theoden and is you know being like theoden son of thangol blah 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 blah. and Mm. meanwhile in the background there's just Legolas, Aragorn, and Gimli taking out all these guys by themselves. <laughs> Legolas does the classic thing where someone approaches him from behind and he raises his yeah. fist behind his yeah. shoulder without looking and <laughs> knocks him out. And yeah, meanwhile, Gandalf is just like, you know, calmly wa- approaching Theoden. <laughs> Theoden says, you have no power here, Gandalf the Grey. And Gandalf's like, I gla- I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> um, Grey? Um, actually, things have changed, honey. <laughs> and then he like goes dramatic wardrobe change. Oof. It's good. It's good. Throws his gray cloak off, reveals that he is Gandalf the White. So my question is, by the mechanics of this, so does that mean Gandalf the White, his like white powers only work when he is dressed in all white? Because Ooh, he was the entire scene, he was Gandalf the White, but. Theoden is only like blown back when he takes the gray cloak off. <laughs> Ooh, right. I kind of like. I feel like that like goes into the, these movies are so like high drama costumey. I like that if he's not wearing the outfit, he doesn't have the powers. That seems like a, a cool rule. <laughs> I always thought of it as just like, uh, well, there's got to be this cool reveal of like him taking off the because he's ob- he's like deliberately deceiving them, right? He's like, you think right. I'm not powerful? You think I'm still just a measly old gray wizard? But I'm a white wizard now. But you're right. He doesn't. Uh, there's no kind of reaction. He doesn't feel the force of Gandalf's power until he takes off the gray cloak and exposes his mm-hmm. white mm-hmm. Uh, outfit. <laughs> So I also like how there's a he like Gandalf gets a dye job like a hair dye like because when when he's Gandalf the gray he has gray hair now that he's Gandalf the white he has like he he got like a straightener a hair straightener smooth it's smooth I love to see it yeah (laughs) so but I'm just like what didn't they notice that his hair color changed also like what isn't that an indication of him becoming Gandalf the White. I don't know. They're men and men don't typically right. notice like, each other. Oh, did you get a haircut? I can I don't Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I mean I I don't I, I'm kind of I, I'm pro costume. I also like to think that if Legolas isn't wearing his wig, his brain doesn't work. <laughs> like <laughs> Yeah, yeah. He so, yeah, so Gandalf starts like using his staff and his power against Theoden and then Theoden's voice changes you hear it's actually Saruman talking. And this is where you realize that he is being possessed, so to speak, by Saruman. Mm -hmm. And like through Wormtongue, Wormtongue has been slowly, you know, manipulating Theoden as well, kind of like tag teaming that to to control him and and Rohan. Gandalf exercises him, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) Or something. Blasts back Saruman. Theoden... I love. I just love the scene. Ah, I just love it so much. Where um, 
uh, you see him transform back into his self that he was before Saruman. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a moment that the, the CGI and effects and stuff held up well. And you see him... His eyes brighten, mm -hmm. he's younger, he's more youthful and lively. And this, watching this last night was truthfully how I felt since they announced that Joe Biden was elected president. Uh, <laughs> just years melted Yeah, we were off all just you. like these gnarled, like mm -hmm. haggard people for the last four years. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly it's like, <gasps> we feel reinvigorated. Um, A centrist Democrat is going to save us all. Uh, <laughs> the 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 effect is really cool and i also like how, wait what was i gonna say shoot i did that uh, that was uh that was one of the effects that i thought was like i i watched it a few times to be like oh wait that was actually that held up really well and the <laughs> and then i got confused again about what their relationship was because yeah, she looks at him yeah. like yeah Oh, you're like, wait, what? So um, I think, uh, with, so with Eowyn and Theoden, they really play up their, you know, surrogate father, surrogate daughter relationship a lot more in the mm -hmm. movie. Um, So that you have this like very sad moment in Return of the King at the end of the battle between them. But yeah, I think it's, I think it's just to show that because Eowyn and Eomer were orphaned at such a young age and he took them in to be his own children, they, they love each other just as deeply as a as a father actually would with his daughter and that relationship is still as strong right mm -hmm. also it's a rare example of a a, a man getting a little makeover <laughs> <laughs> he's like yeah he oh, got his I'm, transformation I'm a little glow up i'm getting a nice little freshen yeah up. exactly just i mean purging a demon will do that for it's really good yeah. for your skin <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and so watching that sequence reminded me, I'm sure you guys have all seen the memes people have been doing. The most famous one is the someone edited the end game scene where uh, Thanos is Trump and then Captain oh America God. is Biden and then the portals open and like ev like mail in votes, <laughs> Nev Nevada, Pennsylvania are, are coming in to save the day. Yeah. So I did my own version of that and I edited this scene mm. and I have um, like people of color, feminists, LGBT community, Pennsylvania, Michigan are fighting off all the bad guys in the background. And then Biden <laughs> is Gandalf and Trump or no, uh, Theoden is America being possessed by Trump. Mm. So that when you see that de-aging happen, you, you feel it in your soul. <laughs> and uh, frankly, I was really proud of it. So go like that on Twitter, please. It's currently pinned to the top of my profile. <laughs> nice. <laughs> But yeah, I just I really like the scene. And like there's immediately more sunlight that comes through after Saruman has been cast out of his soul. Mm -hmm. And then Wormtongue gets a talking to and a beat down. Ooh, Ooh that get his ass. He gets thrown out down the stairs, which frankly I think should have killed him. <laughs> yeah, that would at least looks, broken a couple bones. Looks really <laughs> fragile, you know? <laughs> yeah. He also looks like a, a like if you put Noel Fielding into a microwave for three hours, that's what Worm Tongue looks like <laughs> to me. <laughs> Oh my gosh! <laughs> I just took a I took a sip of water as you said that, and I was just trying not to choke. Oh my god! I just have been watching a lot of Great British Bake Off, and I'm like, that's no, exactly his his look. Same. Oh yes. So speaking of warm tongue, so the actor who plays him, Brad Dorif, mm -hmm. Do yeah. Um, apparently he has a goddaughter named Arwen. Oh, no so kidding. I just thought that was cool. I don't know if that was something where she was born before the movies mm. were made or she was born after. I mean, well, I guess the books existed well before the movies, that too. <laughs> yeah, but I guess it's a question of like, did he name her after, name him after, wait, was it was Arwen or Eowyn? Uh, Arwen. Arwen. If he yes, was like, oh, Arwen. I was in these movies and that, and so that's going to inspire me to name or like, I guess he wouldn't have. It was his goddaughter. I don't yeah, know how naming babies uh -huh. works. I was like, can you? Do I guess that? the Godfather probably doesn't <laughs> name. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I just thought that was a, a cool little fun yeah, fact. That's really sweet. Theoden is about to kill him when Aragorn. Ugh. Just has to come in with the moral high ground. How dare he? Future king of Gondor, whatever. Aragorn with your 
ethics. Yeah. And um, <laughs> it's like, no, don't kill him. And you're kind of like kill him though like yeah he, he's bad and he almost ruined Thaden's light I know I know but whatever we have to show that Aragorn's gonna be a good guy and he's a very moral upstanding and Aragorn's dude. gonna Aragorn <laughs> <laughs> and so Wormtongue runs off on a horse and escapes and makes it his way to to Saruman mm-hmm. oh this is this just like feels like a punch in the gut. Theoden looks around and goes, where is Theodred? Where is my son? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And oh, you feel it because this is truthfully where he, he, he like realizes the consequences of what happened during all this time where he was so unaware of what was happening that he didn't even recognize his own son dying. Mm-hmm. The regret that he must feel that he wasn't able to go see him in his last hours of his life mm-hmm. is just it's just terrible. Yeah. It's really mm-hmm. sad. Yeah. And he has this scene in front of his grave with Gandalf. Um, and this is where they took a lot of lines directly from the book, which I really appreciate okay. um, when they when they do that, just taking, you know, the writers taking the the time to appreciate the original text that this came from, that mm-hmm. they're just like, well, I mean, Tolkien wrote it pretty good the first time around. So let's just do that. <laughs> no punch instead. up needed here. <laughs> but one line that uh, Bernard Hill, who's the actor who plays Theoden, asked the writers to put in is the line about parents shouldn't have to bury their Mm -hmm. child. Um, And this apparently came to him. He was uh, in Scotland, I think it was, one day. And this woman came up to him and I guess started talking. And then she she told him that one of her children had just recently died and told she was the one to tell him parents shouldn't have to bury their children. Mm -hmm. And it was something that apparently stuck with him all those years and all that time. And he wanted them to insert it into the scene here and it Mm. um you know it fits very well and you you feel for him in that moment yeah and then suddenly you stop feeling for him because he immediately goes into being a terrible (sighs) king yeah (laughs) (laughs) so the children the little boy and little girl from earlier on who were escaping the village they show up to Rohan and bring the news that Saruman and his men and everything are attacking and they're going to make their way to Edoras before, you know, before long. Mm -hmm. And so they're discussing what to do. And Gandalf says that they need to protect the women and children and they need to go out. Titanic style. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And they need to go out and fight them and draw Sauron's forces away from Edoras. And Aragorn's like, we have to do like what we have to meet them head on we can't hide from them and Theoden goes last I checked Theoden not Aragorn was king of Rohan and I'm like Bitchy. first of all Bitchy, <laughs> sir <laughs> sir uh last I checked Theoden not Aragorn was possessed by Saruman <laughs> And also, this is where like I wanted Legolas to stand up again, like his moment in Fellowship of the Ring during oh, the Council yeah. of Elrond, where he goes, that is no mere ranger, that is Aragorn, Aragorn son, son of Aragorn. Aragorn. You owe him your allegiance. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but Aragorn just kind of shuts up and he's like, fine, if you're going to be like that. <laughs> Theoden decides that they're going to go, everyone's going to evacuate and go to Helm's Deep. Mm-hmm. Gandalf is like, this is a terrible idea. They are going to get trapped there. Theoden is just being dumb. I'm going to go off and do an obscure mission by myself for the rest of this movie. Bye. (laughs) (laughs) Yup. I didn't really, you know, it didn't really occur to me until literally just now. I knew, I always knew that like, oh, Gandalf goes away and then he doesn't, you know, he shows up in the at the very end, does the deus ex machina for mm. Helm's Deep. Mm-hmm. But it, it, it literally just hit me that, at, I don't know, an hour in, that's it for Gandalf. And then you don't see him until about probably hour two and 58 minutes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because he clear, he goes and find Aemir and his like troops have ridden somewhere else because they all got mm-hmm. banished. Even though he seems to only be riding with like I don't know forty or fifty dudes, and then suddenly yeah, which, yeah, they by were the way, like, Aragorn is like, oh, I know there are two thousand men and it's out like, there. And I'm when, like, that was did he did he go and gather <laughs> yeah, them all I was like, up I saw off screen? Maybe forty of them. Like there is, <laughs> I think maybe yeah. So and the but yeah when they show up at the end there's like this whole army's worth of 
people. And it's like, where'd you get them? Where'd they come from? Anyway. Mm. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Gan- I never thought about that. That Gandalf just disappears for a mm-hmm. solid nearly two hours of the movie. Mm-hmm. Hmm. That does hit me every time it happens. Because it's like Gandalf. Ev- I don't know. I love Everyone loves Gandalf. I'm, ba- I'm a very basic Lord of the Rings enjoyer. So I'm like, where's Gandalf at? Who's Treebeard? <laughs> like, what, what are, who are these people? I'm here for Gandalf. And he just goes away for most of the movie. Yeah. I do love... I- I do also love Gandalf. And this is also just typical Gandalf behavior. (laughs) This is just kind of what he does. And he also, yeah, so he said, he tells Aragorn that on the, on the, what are the, what's the exact The the first light on the fifth day, look to the east. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I'm I'm like, how do you know, how does Gandalf know exactly the exact moment you know oh, he's a wizard he just knows it's stuff. gonna take like, me five days ian mckellen stuff <laughs> also okay back to the like he disappears and he goes off and does okay here's something i noticed when i watched the whole trilogy recently where like there are t- opportunities for the rest of the fellowship to like go and find frodo after who like is in clear need of help because he's always getting lost and he's getting attacked by Gollum and stuff like that. Sam won't stop tripping. <laughs> like <laughs> Sam's like uh, Sandra Bullock in a rom com, just yeah. prat falling everywhere. <laughs> but they're like, they're like, gee, I hope Frodo's okay. And it's like, why don't go find him? He needs your help. <laughs> and it's, they're just like, hey, he's probably fine. He's a hobbit who's never left the Shire, but he can do this. I'm always right. just like, why aren't you going and trying to help him a bit more? I know. Anyway, that's just a little gripe I had. I think um, it it comes. I think it comes down to like two things. The first is just that they know that if they get that close to the ring, they could risk you know what happened to Boromir. Oh sure, mm-hmm. yeah, and they don't. You know, they don't want to risk hurting. Frodo because they can easily overpower him <laughs> um, if they became corrupted by the He's ring. two feet tall. True. Yeah. <laughs> True. And then I think the other thing is that they realize that their attention is needed where they are now. Mm. That they, ca- they can't really go and find Frodo and Sam anymore because they are needed in Rohan and they're needed in Gondor to do all these things because all of their leaders are terrible. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, because they're white men. (laughs) We got, yeah. Oh, I will say, so earlier we were talking about how like all of, you know, Sauron's forces are very, are coded as being people of color Mm -hmm. of some kind, you know. Mm -hmm. I will say, however, the nine ring wraiths are originally old white men. And you do see that. So like at least there, you know, there is that little dig. That yeah. that dig at old white men that are easily <laughs> corrupted, and yep, indeed, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and yeah. So Ar- uh, what's his face? Gandalf <laughs> goes off, tells Aragorn to look for him on the yeah the first light on the fifth day, <laughs> just so you know Shakespearean and, and dramatic. He's speaking mm-hmm. in riddles a lot. Legolas also mm-hmm. speaks in a lot of riddles, and it's just like oh this yeah, it's too hard. It's just really say fun. what you mean. Orlando Bloom's performance, just like living in the future and knowing he's like definitively, we as a culture have realized he is actually a very bad actor. Uh, (laughs) I just remember giving him the benefit of the doubt for so long being like, he must be making some sort of choice there. But he doesn't. I'm like, I'm not convinced he fully knows what he's saying at all. Like he's just saying the words (laughs) in order. Like, (laughs) and that's all. I see the thing is that like, I think it works really well for Legolas because the elves are are just kind of supposed to be like weird ominous people anyway mm-hmm. you know they're supposed to be a little bit ethereal mm-hmm. you're i i've made the comparison that i think the elves are actually aliens that have come to middle earth they're trying to like assimilate and blend in and learn more about the culture the culture and the peoples there mm-hmm. but they also don't exactly understand how to act normally interesting right. and as they're an like- actor i mean yeah orlando bloom does seem like a person who just learned how people acted <laughs> it fits right it's sort of like how I love Arnold Schwarzenegger much. is really good as the Terminator and not very good as anything else in any other right but you're like oh that's in. just how he talks that's just like his <laughs> I don't cadence. know I think he was he was pretty good in um oh shoot what's it jingle all the way <laughs> That's true, and and Kindergarten Cop, another iconic yeah. one. 
excellent orlando bloom i mean yeah orlando bloom got lucky twice and then never again and you know here we are oh well actually three times if you count marrying Katy perry I, that's what i was gonna say yeah <laughs> he um truthfully he can i think has he like been in anything recently yes he was in this really i well i apologize if if, if anyone listening enjoyed it he was in this really crummy uh amazon prime series with cara delavine where he plays like a fairy hunter oh yeah i saw the trailer <laughs> for that it's, i had to watch it for work i had to watch the first couple of episodes and it's it's brutal oh man apparently he's I don't know, been working kind of regularly, at least. Mm. He had several projects in 2017, and then, yeah, one in 2019 and 2020. See, I thought he could, because, like, once you, like, imagine you're Orlando Bloom. You, so he landed this role two, either two days after or before, I can't remember, he graduated from acting school. Yes, I remember this. So (laughs) weird. So you, you graduate acting school. You immediately go to start working for the next three years on The Lord of the Rings. The biggest movies at that time. (laughs) Yeah. You have people like Ian McKellen and Sir Christopher Lee on. And then he goes to the next most gigantic Pirates of the Caribbean. And then, yeah, meanwhile, he's also, yeah, after that's done, he goes to film for Pirates of the Caribbean. That's so successful that they do two more sequels and then a bunch more sequels that no one asked for. (laughs) And it's like then that everyone was like, wait a second, is this guy even good? (laughs) (laughs) Or is he just pretty? Yeah, or is he just like around? And then eventually... You marry Katy Perry. Mm. I think yeah. at that. I think after I finished filming the last Pirates of the Caribbean movie, I would just call. You know, be like, "Well, I had a. I'm gonna. I'm gonna stop there. You Quit know, while I'm ahead. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I. So you uh, have to. Admi- I mean, I'm like, I'm, I'm. I guess I don't. I mean, you don't have to admire it. I take it back. I. I just <laughs> think his career is interesting because he just like really was in everything for so long, and then he was in nothing. And now Mm -hmm. he's split the difference and he's in some things that no one watches. (laughs) I'm constantly terrified, even though this isn't this isn't like a huge podcast or anything. It has been getting more traction now that I'm covering the movies. Mm -hmm. And I'm constantly terrified that the Lord of the Rings cast is going to find it, (laughs) especially Sean Astin, (gasps) because I'm afraid he's because I'm uh, I'm not a huge fan of his acting in this movie. So I'm just Fair enough. if you're listening, Orlando Bloom, if you're listening, Sean Astin, I still love you deeply for your level of commitment and everything in these movies. Yeah, If you're listening to this, Orlando Bloom, <laughs> Venmo, all three of us. You're, yeah, <laughs> seriously. You're rich as Shire. Give us that Pirates of the Caribbean money. Love the wig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're hot as Legolas. Also, yep. if you're listening, John Reese Davies, who plays Gimli and yes. voices Treebeard, he's like staunchly pro Brexit. And so I would just like to say, screw you, sir. And if you're anyway. listening, Andy Circus, you're king <laughs> and we love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. Uh, speaking of John Reese Davies, I. <laughs> So this will give you guys a little bit of a insight to like how clueless I was coming into this series and these mm. movies and everything. <laughs> I learned that John Reese Davies recently was the villain, the villainous uncle in Princess Diaries 2 Royal Engagement. <gasps> Wait, is he? Yes. <laughs> and I immediately he's um Chris Pine's uncle in that movie. Mm. And I immediately was like, like if someone had been like, oh, John Reese Davies, you know, Gimli, I would have been like, uh-huh. Uh, yeah. And then if they said Chris Pine's uncle in Princess Diaries 2, a royal engagement, I would be like, yes, that's it. (laughs) That's how I know it. Wow. Now it's like a, that, that, that is like a huge, that's an even huger betrayal that just doubles down the betrayal of Mm. of John Reese Davies. Unbelievable. So, uh, anywho, um, I'm trying really hard not to dig too deep into any of these actors like in real life because I I made the mistake of doing that for Viggo Mortensen and um it's just a little bit disappointing because oh, no. you expect him to look like Aragorn and he doesn't. Oh. Hey there, it's Mary Clay from the future here with the terrible news that somehow I forgot to include the most important segment of these episodes. Is Viggo Mortensen actually a ranger? 
So I will I will do that now. While filming the trilogy, Viggo Mortensen got so into the role that during a conversation, Peter Jackson referred to him as Aragorn for half an hour without realizing it. I don't blame you, PJ. I don't blame you. And that concludes this week's segment of Is Viggo Mortensen Actually a Ranger? Anyway, yeah. So speaking of Aragorn, <laughs> we cut to a scene with Eowyn and she is preparing to battle and she takes out a sword and does some like practice swings and then Aragorn for no reason at all other than to establish sexual tension swings his sword out and stops hers and they clash for a moment Mm -hmm. he's like oh so you fight and she just like stares at him (laughs) which is weird like it's weird already because it's like yeah she was just fighting when you like walked up on her Uh, her her eyes (laughs) <laughs> it looks like a lemur. Is that what I'm imagining right now? I yeah, think. the very wide eyed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just like. Yes. <gasps> she's very intense. She is. And she's like, the women of Rohan learned a long time ago that we had to take up our own swords if we wanted to live because the men here are truthfully useless. <laughs> no, that's not what she says, but. But in a way, the is there. <laughs> it's this scene is so. I mean, I I always cling to this scene because you just don't really get a woman with a line this long very often. <laughs> but the scene itself is kind of strange, where he just like shows up behind her, which always makes me personally uncomfortable when a man is just like boo, and then you're like. Ugh. And then he, she acts like, I don't, they, they both act like she wasn't just swinging a sword around in the middle of a huge room. Like she, and then she immediately gives him so much information that he didn't ask for. And that's the scene. <laughs> yeah. He, um, he, I don't, I forget like how they get there, but she says like, or he says, what are, what do you fear, milady? I don't think he says milady, but, um, and she said, it's a line from the book, but it's later mm-hmm. on in Return of the King, actually. And she oh. says, um, she says, I, I fear a cage. And so, so this is actually where we have a big deference from, is that the, I don't think I just used that word correctly. Whatever. There's a big, <laughs> I know what like you mean. Deviation. Deviation. Off course. Yeah from from the book mm-hmm. because in two towers what happens here I, I guess i'll give this like to the tiny credit of the movie producers mm-hmm. <laughs> in the books first of all they don't evacuate to helm's deep they don't evacuate to helm's deep they say they basically are like oh we're gonna go that way and have the battle there and eowyn you are gonna stay here and you are gonna be our de facto ruler while we're gone and you're going to keep everything in line and protect things if people come to try and loot everything and you're in charge of the women and children and people who are staying behind here Mm -hmm. so like that's cool but then they leave her and you don't see her again until return of the king Mm -hmm. and then they leave her again Mm -hmm. and then you don't see her until she rolls up on the battlefield and kills the witch king Mm -hmm. so at least in the movie they bring her with them so you get to see more of her yes i do appreciate them including her more because otherwise, it's just like, all right, now we're down to half of a fem- female character that and, we're like yeah. sort of sometimes seeing. And of the female characters, I mean, she's definitely like my favorite. And I like there's mm-hmm. she has the I mean, every every all three of the women's arcs are very connected to the male characters. But I feel like Awen has the most like if we're looking for even the glimmer of like wow look she like really defied the odds and like worked outside of her expected Mm -hmm. role you know you there's at least something for you there and i'll take it yeah you do you do kind of at least get this impression that like there are a lot of things that she does that are kind of for her own battles and her Mm -hmm. for herself you know yeah and her own self-worth and and things like that and she does have a lot more agency at least than the other Mm -hmm. female characters so at least there's that still not great whatever (laughs) no (laughs) um so what hat what happens here in this scene yeah she's like i fear basically she's like i fear of falling into obscurity and becoming a housewife Mm -hmm. and a forgotten woman while everyone else is doing cool stuff on the battlefield Mm -hmm. and aragorn says but you're a lady of rohan that won't ever happen to you because you're rich 
Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're like, okay. Uh, and then we have one of many. They exchange what I call a longing glance that to me seems very reciprocated on both ends. They both look intensely at each other for a minute and then, and then you know, go their separate ways. And it's just, again, like, why would they do this to us in this movie if you were just going to disappoint me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember in like the because I did also watch all of the special features and all of the director's commentary <laughs> and the actor's commentary and all that stuff. And I remember there being discussion of like, because correct me if I'm wrong here, but like Arwen is barely in the books. She's really only in like mm-hmm. the appendices. Yeah. And apparently that part is very sad. I was mm-hmm. actually told yeah. don't read it. Okay. Because you'll just be depressed. <laughs> and no. I was like, oh, okay then. Whoa. <laughs> Yikes. So them, again, including choosing to include her more in the movies is something I appreciate. So I remember the like the directors and, and or the director and the writers and, and stuff being like, oh, yeah, we, you know, we wanted to set up this kind of love triangle situation, which is usually annoying t- to me. Classic but- <laughs> lazy writing. Right. Like, what conflict would a woman have beside a love triangle? But anyway, <laughs> they, they're they like, yeah, we're, we're like making Aragorn have to feel conflicted between, okay, well, does he be with this elf maiden who he loves, but it's like not practical and she would have to make this huge sacrifice to be with him. And like, that's asking a lot. That would him like, that would be him asking a lot of her and like all this stuff. Or does he consider like, being with Eowyn, who he would be way more compatible with, and there wouldn't have to be all these sacrifices and, and, and stuff like that. And I remember them like wanting to incorporate that like inner tor- turmoil of Aragorn mm-hmm. in the movie, which, yeah, I guess you kind of see because he is like looking at her sometimes and being like, hmm, should He's I? He's so stoic, though, that it's even like hard to read. Like, what is he thinking about? That's He's true. Just, like sexy resting face and you're like I like it but what is he thinking (laughs) right sexy resting face I love that (laughs) that's amazing and accurate also I think we might have kind of glossed over this part did we already get to the part where they're like deliberating on what they should do and Eowyn is like tending to the children the two children messengers who have come right yeah oh yeah yeah in the yeah this yeah we talked about how they're um uh how they're deciding what to do and Theoden's being a terrible leader right okay Um, yes yes, yes. in that yeah in that scene the two children are sitting there eating and and she like they're like where's my mama and she's (laughs) like shh yes this is an iconic moment for us uh, at the Bechtel cast because this is one of the only times in the entire film franchise where two female <gasps> characters communicate with each Even other. interact. Yeah. Oh my all. gosh, you are right. So this is And this we is do know both us. of their names. Yeah. Because we know Eowyn's name and in an earlier scene that little girl gets named as I think like Frida or Freda or something like that. Yeah. So we know their names but they don't really speak here because the little girl says, where is mama? And Eowyn says, shh. <laughs> Which yeah, if you're doing like a, a and oh. I, I think in if when we were trying to figure it out we didn't give it a pass because just the whole franchise has no interest in women speaking. But it was this was so so close. So close. Right. If Aowen oh had just been gosh. like she's in the village and or not she's like, on her way or something. Up. That would have been a pass, but she could have said, said, said like, shut up. Shh. Thank you so but much for pointing this out. My mind is blown. Wow, I can't believe it. Two Towers is actually a sensational feminist, a feminist female text. empowerment movie. <gasps> Wow, breaking news, everyone. <laughs> Lord of the Rings is all about female empowerment. I haven't we did it, y'all. <laughs> I haven't watched I haven't rewatched this movie since uh we we did the our episodes on it a couple of years ago and I like shrieked. I was like, Oh yeah, where is Mama <laughs> Shh? An iconic Mama interaction. Sh- <laughs> wow. Also, wow, wow. like Eowyn is the one like tending to the children in that moment because yeah. mm-hmm. it's like well women be mm-hmm. motherly yeah i guess so i'll combat that with and it's something that from my understanding is just extended edition but in the in the books a huge plot line for aragorn's character is that as the king he also 
has the hands of a healer and so he goes into the houses of the healing after the big after the battle in return of the king and heals his people and that was like really powerful to to read about like you have someone in this position of power and leadership like he's a ranger he's the most like epitome of of masculinity as you could get yeah (laughs) and uh and then but then he's also a healer and that's like very powerful i did not know that i think in in general i will say lord of the rings does a really good job of tackling this idea of toxic masculinity because you see a lot of these char- a lot of the male characters they hug each other all the time they kiss each other they cry mm-hmm. you see Theoden break down and cry in front of his son's grave mm-hmm. it's very it's very powerful in that sense and it's you know i think that's a at least you know i think that's very positive especially cuz like i'm sure there are a lot of little boys who watch lord of the rings mm-hmm. to see that like oh yeah aragorn's really tough and but like you see him cry in certain scenes and he's also very quiet and contemplative and smart and has a lot of other qualities other than just like yeah let's go kill people yeah. yeah yeah this whole franchise with men emoting is great and the characters who do display toxic masculinity are often poised as being like characters who we are, know are wrong like mm-hmm. what's yeah. the guy in return of the king who's like the steward of gondor i forget his like real name but like denethor first name. denethor yeah he mm-hmm. like he's like epitome of toxic masculinity and then he has like it's his it's his downfall like it it mm-hmm. causes his demise yeah I, that is true so i mean that being said i'm still never ever going to argue that like lord of the rings <laughs> is a, a feminist, feminist icon you know whatever <laughs> <laughs> but wait, but wait, but wait. Uh, what about the part where it's, where is Mama? Shh. <laughs> where is Mama? <laughs> Shh. Shut up. <laughs> and like, I laugh a little bit because you just know that Eowyn doesn't want to say, well, she's probably dead. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. luckily later on, you see them reunite at Helm's Deep. So like, that's cute. But <laughs> the reality of the situation is much darker, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh, um, man, I can't believe that. Thank you so much for pointing that out, because that is very pivotal for for this movie. Yeah, Game changer. <laughs> and so, yeah, so they all set off for Helm's Deep, and then Wormtongue has made his way back to Saruman in the meanwhile and tells him that they he's like, I, they're going to go to Helm's Deep. That's what they always do. They always go there and hide. So we're going to have a battle there. And Saruman... It's or I think Wormtongue actually said he's like it's a long and dangerous road there, mm-hmm. and I'm like, well, then why would you do that? Like the whole point is that you're trying to be safer to go there, but apparently right. it's a long and dangerous road, whatever. And then you see you don't actually see them because that reveal will come later, but you see the shadows of some kind of creature, like monster beast, being created in Isengard, mm-hmm. and I'm assuming that's just Saruman's. As I've said multiple times before, it's just vague wizard magic (laughs) that creates those beasts. And that's where we are going to leave this episode discussion. And I can't believe I'm like so thankful now that I cut it down. I cut the section down to 30 (laughs) minutes because we would have been talking for another half hour probably about stuff that happens in the 10 minutes afterwards. So, (laughs) all right, cool. So first of all, is there anything in our episode, in our discussion that uh, we like glossed over or something that you wanted to bring up? I had that was everything no, for me. Oh yeah, I I am I would be embarrassed to show you my notes. <laughs> <laughs> Just the the very important. Where's Mamush? Is all that we needed to to go back uh, over. Where's Mamush? It was oh god, it was worth the entire rewatch. Just because, first of all, these movies are, are great, but also just to hit that sweet. Where is Mamush? I'm also just so glad that I happened to get you guys on for this episode for like for this part of the movie that has that because i had zero i like i didn't <laughs> pay attention to that at all you know it's the only exchange that comes close there's one other exchange that exchange that comes close 
to passing in. It's with the same little girl and her mom a little bit earlier when the mm-hmm. Urukai start to invade their yeah. village, and she's like, she sent, she's like putting her little children on the horse and being like, "Go run and raise the alarm or whatever." And then the little girl says something like, "I forget what she Isn't says," like- and then the mom responds, but we never learn the mom's name. So if yeah. you're using that caveat oh, of the Bechdel test, mm-hmm. then it doesn't. So it doesn't pass. pass. But yeah. yeah, whereas Mama yep. sh- is just like it. That is feminism <laughs> for many, for many. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Excellent. <laughs> exactly what Tolkien had in mind. <laughs> um, all right, cool. So that brings us to the end of the episode. Caitlin and Jamie, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people find you on the internet? Uh, you can listen to us on the Bechtel cast. That's our weekly podcast where we do an intersectional analysis of uh popular movies we've done an episode on all of the lords of the rings that Mm -hmm. if you're a fan of the books you might not like the episode yeah (laughs) uh anyone who is a fan of the books uh really railed against us for reasons that i don't understand i think it's a it's because we haven't read the books (laughs) because we haven't read the books sorry (laughs) but we never promised to be an adaptation podcast anyway clearly we're not (laughs) bitter at all about it we're not over it (laughs) but um yeah we did we recorded a very long episode about lord of the rings it's uh two parts that we broke it up into um so check that out and check out the whole podcast you can follow us uh there uh or you can follow us on twitter uh or instagram at bechtocast and if you want to you know follow us individually i'm at caitlin durante on uh instagram and twitter and i'm uh jamie loftus help on twitter and jamie christ superstar on instagram Jamie Christopher. <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing. <laughs> that's just my problem. That's great. That's great. Oh, truly fantastic. That's what I'm talking about is a proud member of WBNE. You can learn more about the network by going to WBNE.org where you will find all of our other shows like Bagels. Hello and welcome to Bagels. I'm Emily Carlin. And I'm Tyler Carlin. And welcome to our crazy, chaotic, and loving life. It is so much fun, and bagels is an opportunity for us to just talk about love, relationships, and sometimes we get a little deep, and sometimes... We get really silly. We get really silly. So if this Uh, sounds like the kind of thing you'd be into, check bagels out wherever you get your podcasts, and on Spotify, or WBNE.org. I love you. I love you. Bye. Bye. The cover is by Graphite, aka Vaishan Brandon. You can support him on Instagram at graphite.vmb. You can find the podcast on Twitter and Instagram at Tolkien About Pod. You can find me on Twitter at MC WhatsApp and Instagram at MC Turn Down for What. And you can also become a patron and support the podcast. Go to patreon.com slash Tolkien About Pod to find the different tiers and financial levels that I have. And this week's sponsor is Alan. Alan is a new patron. And thank you so much for supporting the podcast. Uh, I've connected with you on social media a couple times and appreciate the the memes that you have DM'd me. Um, So thank you for for supporting the podcast. And then next week we will be covering, so we'll pick up where we left off on the movie this week at one hour, 11 minutes and 54 seconds. And we'll go to one hour, 45 minutes and 28 seconds, just as Elrond and Galadriel end their very dramatic elf telepathic conversation (laughs) thing. (laughs) That I don't truthfully understand, but we'll get there when they're we get aliens. There. They can astral project. Yes, <laughs> that's exactly it. The astral project- projection thing, though, that actually makes a lot more sense given what happens with Arwen and Aragorn too right. in this movie. So, you know what? I believe that a hundred percent. All right. All that being said, uh, do you guys have any parting words for the audience? Yeah, I guess all I have to say is. Where is Mama? And then I, in response to that, Jamie, I would like to say, shh. <laughs> and that's what I'm talking about. Oh, that's too perfect. <laughs> Eowyn shows off her swordsmanship. Her swords. Why am I pronouncing the W in sword all of a sudden? <laughs> Eowyn shows off her swordsmanship, or shall I say sword. I did it again. Why am I pronouncing the W in sword? Oh my god. Okay. Awen shows off her swordsmanship, or shall I say swords...
so sword swore swore <laughs> sword so swore sword so so <laughs>